Good afternoon. I'm Eric Martin. I'm correspondent in Washington covering the IMF, World Bank, and international financial institutions. We're here today for a discussion of sovereigns, supranational, and agencies uh, for the Canadian Fixed Income Conference. And I'm joined today by three experts, Zauresh Zezhenyeva, funding, funding officer uh, of the International Finance Corporation, IFC, the private sector arm of the World Bank Group, Brandon Weening, senior vice president of corporate finance for OMERS, Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System, Canadian Pension Fund, as well as Eusebio Gare, head of funding for IDB Invest, which is the private sector arm of the Inter-American Development Bank. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give a brief introduction and then jump into some questions. Uh, Zauresh, would you like to start us off? Sure. Um, thank you and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Zaresh Kajanyeva, Funding Officer with International Finance Corporation, and I've been working with IFC for six years covering the North American market. Thank you. Uh, Brandon. Thank you. I'm Brandon Weening, OMERS Senior Vice President of Corporate Finance. I've been in OMERS for three years and previous to that at Oxford Properties in our real estate arm doing financing there. Eusebio. Thank you, Eric, uh, for the invitation to join this panel. I am Eusebio Garre, Head of Funding at IDB Invest. As Head of Funding, I am responsible for IDB Invest's global funding program and investor relation activities. Thank you so much. Um, Zauresh, I'm wondering if, beginning if we, with you, if you could each tell us a little bit about uh, the mission, uh, both within your particular role, as well as the mission for your institution. Um, sure. So, um, IFC's mission overall is to fight poverty and uh, work on reducing, um, work actually on promoting the shared prosperity by uh, providing loans and equity investments to businesses in emerging markets. So actually, IFC is, in fact, the, the world's largest uh, development institution focused exclusively on investing in uh, private sector. IFC, as you mentioned, is the member of the World Bank Group, um, but it is a separate legal entity with a separate balance sheet and separate funding program. Um, it's a AAA-rated issuer, and uh, our annual funding program in the long term, in the long, um, for, for the long-term funding, uh, runs between 12 and 14 billion, um, typically on an annual basis. So, my mission and my role as a funding officer is to uh, get the best funding for the corporation, is to uh, promote diversification of our funding sources and broad broaden our investor base. And so, as such, um, we are known as a frequent issuer of private placements that are being tailored to specific needs of investors, um, depending on a currency or a structure. So, for instance, last year we issued um, private placements in 28 different currencies, all in response to reverse inquiries from our investors. And at the same time, we also uh, strive to maintain consistent presence in public markets, such as in the US, in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada as well. Um, and with respect to the Canadian market, um, uh, taking into account the size of our funding program, we were able to, um, to, to place in the Canadian dollar market between 500 and 750 million on an annual basis uh, in recent years, and we target to continue expanding our investor base there. Gotcha. Thank you so much, Zauresh. Uh, Brandon, could you tell us a little bit about OMERS and uh, your mission and objectives? Sure, happy to. So OMERS is an acronym for the Ontario Municipal Employee Retirement System. We are the exclusive pension provider for municipal employees in the province of Ontario, which is Canada's largest province, has about 14 million people as a population. We have about 500,000 members, either active, retired, or deferred, and we are providing defined benefit pension plans to all of the employees of the municipal sector, including union and non-union, whether they be um, civil servants or in emergency personnel, whether they be part of local boards or electrical utilities, transit systems, and sometimes school boards as well. 
Um, our goal is to provide sustainable, affordable, and meaningful defined benefit pensions to all of those members for the long term. And we have that exclusive mandate through legislation by the province of Ontario. My role as a Senior Vice President of Corporate Finance is varied. I am certainly responsible for the team that oversees our funding program. Um, we are an SSA issuer since 2019, AAA rated or one notch below, depending on the credit rating agency. And to date, we have six notes, about $8 billion Canadian outstanding. And so I lead the team responsible for that funding program, as well as for our credit rating and investor relationships. My, my role is broad enough to also include financial and regulatory reporting, procurement, um, forecasting and operating plans, as well as financial systems and financial operations more broadly. Okay. Brandon, thank you so much. Eusebio, could you tell us, please, about uh, the mission of IDB Invest, as well as your role with IDB Invest? Absolutely. I am Eusebio Garre, mm -hmm. and I am the head of funding at IDB Invest. I am responsible for IDB Invest's global funding program and investor relation activities. IDB Invest is the private sector institution of the Inter-American Development Bank Group. We are a distinct institution separate from IDB. We have our own balance sheet, our own funding program, and our own ratings, AAA by Fitch, AA Plus by S&P, and AA1 by Moody's. We are a supranational issuer and multilateral development bank focused on promoting the development of private sector companies in Latin America and the Caribbean to advance the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Our shareholders are 47 countries, from the Americas, Europe, and Asia. The USA are the largest shareholder. IDB Invest Business Strategy focuses currently on five opportunities, regional integration and strengthening value chains, support for small and medium-sized enterprises, promotion of a digital economy, gender and inclusion, and climate action. We have <clears throat> currently $5 billion of issues outstanding and an annual funding program of around $2 billion. Our funding strategy balances regular presence in our core markets, US dollar, Australian dollar, and Mexican pesos, with diversification in other currencies through private placements. We also have an Euro commercial paper program, which we expect to launch in the near future. Thank you so much, Eusebio. It's been attributed to Winston Churchill, uh, the idea of never letting a good crisis go to waste. And given that we're coming out of one of the biggest global crises of anyone's lifetime, I'm curious to hear from each of you about the opportunities that you see uh, in the near term, uh, as well as uh, what are the uh, the greatest challenges facing you uh, in your job and for your institution? If we can start with uh, Zauresh. Um, I would say that on the institutional level, the key challenge for us is helping our clients rebound from the pandemic. So our first emergency response was to provide 8 billion fast-track COVID-19 facility for our existing clients um, to provide them with liquidity to stay in business and to preserve jobs. And um, subsequent to this um, immediate uh, relief um, action, the current challenge for IFC is to ensure that there's a resilient recovery for our clients, be it um, helping them with uh, um, production of vaccines or distribution of vaccines or unlocking some new investment opportunities. So resilient recovery for our clients um, and helping um, our clients to achieve it is probably one of the key challenges and opportunities for us as an institution. I would also say um, from the institutional perspective, another challenge and opportunity is working on smooth transition to new alternative reference rates. IFC has developed a LIBOR transition plan and is implementing it in stages across the institution. So actually, um, starting from February this year, we swap all of our issuance, regardless, sorry, all of our um, fixed rate issuance, uh, regardless of the currency, to SOFR. And so um, as of today, from February as of today, 
we have swapped um, 7 billion of our new issuance to the new uh, benchmark rate so far. Um, at the same time, on the issuance front, we have been supporting the library transition with issuance of SOFR benchmark in June. And just a few weeks ago, um, in September, we um, issued um, the US 2 billion benchmark bond um, marketed and priced against SOFR in support of the SOFR First initiative and to embrace the new environment. So this actually has been a precedent in our segment and um, it was actually interesting to be part of this um, interesting trade. We have received a very strong support from our investor base and I'm happy to share that um, we observe no investor sensitivity to the use of SOFR as the new reference rate in uh, pricing a new issuance, in pricing new fixed rate issuance. So I would say these are the two um, opportunities um, and challenges we're facing. Thank you, Zaresh. Uh, Brandon, are, are those some of the same opportunities and challenges that you see, or how uh, how is your institution experiencing this moment? Sure, Eric. I'm going to um, answer it just a little bit differently. And first, I'll talk about Omers as an investor of the pension fund assets and then uh, around our financing program. So as an investor, we have investments in, of course, public equities and credit and fixed income, while we also have private assets in infrastructure, real estate and private equity. And I would say we see opportunities in all of those asset classes, both within our existing book and across the globe, where we look to invest primarily in the United States, in Europe, and in the Asia-Pacific region, as well as, of course, Canada here, our home country. As an issuer of debt, I'd say we see opportunity in just growing and maturing our program. I mentioned at the beginning that we started our program in 2019. We now have six bonds outstanding, but only across three currencies three in U.S. dollars, two in Canadian, and we did our inaugural euro issuance last year in 2020 um, during the height of the pandemic, I'll say. We see an additional opportunity to continue to increase in those currencies, but also to look into other currencies where OMERS already has natural investments, be it in pounds or Australian dollars or perhaps some others that are out there. I'd say one of the challenges for us is, as a fairly newcomer to the SSA space and a smaller one at that, we do one or two bonds a year in the spring of every year. Uh, sometimes it's a challenge to get investor uh, attention. Sometimes it's a challenge when we're doing a deal to hear that we're not on an approved list. And so we're more and more open and eager to meet with investors to do investor relations work, either virtually or hopefully one day when the world opens up a little bit more on the ground face face so that we can get more and more on the approved lists, um, be it at official institutions or at bank treasuries or what have you. Um, we're focused intently on that over the next little while. Thank you, Brandon. Eusebio, how is IDB Invest experiencing this moment in terms of both opportunity and challenge with its investment and in issuance uh, in the Americas? Well, while the rollout of vaccines and other measures <clears throat> have succeeded in mitigating the spread of COVID to some extent, the success has been uneven and the forecasted return to normal is still nowhere near. So uh, regardless, we see, we do see economic growth picking up across the world, also in Latin America and the Caribbean. Having said that, this development is complicated by the resurgence of COVID cases, hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, with the rise of new variants of the virus. Governments and central banks are trying a number of approaches to address the COVID risks while avoiding to shut down economies as it happened in 2020. Rising inflation across the world doesn't make it the task easier, forcing central banks to tread carefully between the two goals of price stability and supporting economic growth. Uh, as an institution, <clears throat> IDB Invest set up a COVID-19 response program in 2020, the largest of, of $7 billion, the largest lending program in IDB Invest's history, focused on mitigating the impact of the pandemic. In 2021, we focus on projects that help reignite the economy, create jobs, and improve the long-term prospects of the economies in Latin America and the Caribbean, especially from an environmental and social point of view. 
so far, <clears throat> the extremely low number of non-performing loans which uh, we have uh, seen on, on among our clients seem to indicate that focusing on environmentally and socially responsible companies also helps deliver a superior credit performance. This growth of lending uh, has allowed us to uh, has has given a rise to opportunities on the on the bond issuance side. We have been able to issue three U.S. dollar benchmark bonds in the last 18 months: a two-year bond, a three-year bond, um, both COVID-19 response bonds in 2020, and a five-year one billion dollar sustainability bond in February of this year, which was also the inaugural bond under our sustainable debt framework. This offers investors a full curve to price future deals of IDB Invest across different maturities. And another opportunity which came along with, uh, with the pandemic uh, for us as an issuer is uh, that we moved on from a few in-person roadshows a year with a lot of travel uh, to what we call the 24-7 roadshows. So we are now engaging with investors pretty much on a daily basis, uh, certainly on a weekly basis with one or the other across the world. And uh, the acceptance of the digital format, uh, the, the video conference as an investor communication tool has made this possible for us to engage with many more investors and uh, make ourselves uh, known to, to the broader investor community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Eusebio. Um, what is, for each of you, your approach to ESG investing uh, or to ESG is issuance? And what is a final message that you would like for viewers of this panel today to take away from this experience? Um, starting with uh, Zauresh. Um, so I would say that IFC's approach to ESG investing um, and issuance has been holistic. We are an issuer, investor, provider of advisory services, technical assistance to promote ESG themes. Basically, all of the projects IFC finances have to comply with our environmental and social standards that are viewed as one of the key ESG standards applied in private sector investments. And disclosure on our website is uh, required for each project before the investment is made. Um, beyond investment, we also have a history of promoting ESG themes in the capital markets. We've been issuing green bonds since 2010, and we had our social bond program since 2017. Um, and I can say that throughout all of those years, um, We've seen and contributed to um, development of standards and definitions. We've seen how involved um, investors became. We've seen how, um, uh, how investors demand more transparency and disclosure with respect to expected impact. We've also observed how, um, how flexible and how responsive to the current economic environment this instrument can be as we all witnessed a quadrupling of social bond issuance uh, post the start of the pandemic. Um, and I also want to mention that our approach to um, ESG um, issuance has always been based on the responsiveness to investor needs. So for years, we've uh, heard from investors a request um, to um, share information. Let's say if I invest $1,000 um, in IFC's green bond, what can I actually report to my stakeholders in terms of the targeted impact? And so we listen to the investors. And um, in our recent impact reports, we've provided those statistics, um, we provided um, some easy comparisons. Um, so I would say that the message um, I, w I, w I want to relate to this particular topic is that um, such continuous dialogue with investors, of, as you say, we mentioned, in a digital format and 24-7 basis or otherwise, is very, very important for us as an issuer, and it's also very important for development of ESG products in the capital markets. Thank you, Zaurash. Um, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, I want to make sure we have time, uh, Brandon and Eusebio, for each of you uh, to address this final question. Um, so let's go to Brandon. 
Sure. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I'll talk about OMERS as an investor, then as a debt issuer, and then I'll end with the closing comments. So as an investor, our approach to ESG is generally it's grounded in four overarching principles. The first is integration. We integrate ESG considerations throughout the investment life cycle, be it at underwriting, through asset management or development or property operations, and then finally upon exit. It is not a one-time discussion or decision. It's throughout the life of the asset that while we own it. Uh, we also believe in engagement. We engage very frequently and very often with our investee companies. So as an investor in the public capital or in the public equity space, um, we use our proxy voting and sometimes we'll have conversations with management and with boards as necessary or as considered needed. Um, we will also engage through our infrastructure and private equity investments through our seats on the board that we typically attain when we make investments there and we will advance the cause of ESG through board discussions. And in our real estate arm, Oxford Properties, we engage with our tenants, with our co-developers or other partners with those who contribute to the operations of the property to make sure that ESG considerations are again considered throughout the life of the property. Um, in addition to engagement, we believe in uh, collaboration. We practice collaboration through meeting and discussing and working with like-minded institutional investors across the globe to advance the standards uh, around ESG, the regulatory reporting or otherwise, as well as to just generally advance the cause. One example of that is in 2020, our CEO, Blake Hutchison, joined with the CEOs of other major Canadian pensions, joined together in a statement calling for increased disclosure and information from investee companies around their ESG risks and otherwise so that investors can make more fully informed decisions. And finally, our fourth approach is adaptation. We know that this space continues to evolve, so too does OMERS in its approach and monitoring that space. One example of the adaptation then links to our issuance. We've not yet issued a green bond or a sustainable bond. As I mentioned, we're fairly um, new to the scene in SSAs starting in 2019, but we do have a green and sustainable bond framework underway. We're working with a structuring agent and with a second party opinion provider as well so that we can have that ready when the opportunity arises. In terms of final messages, I think what I'd like to let investors know is we are the exclusive pension provider for me, for uh, municipal employees in the province of Ontario. We operate independently of the province. We have our own governance structure. We limit our leverage to about 10% of the plan's net assets, so we maintain conservative leverage, and any debt that we're talking about under this SSA program ranks ahead of those liabilities. All of those factors combined to give us a AAA rating or one notch below. We're happy to meet with investors as we grow this program and as you look for additional names to add to your, uh, to your approved list. Thank you. Eusebio, uh, the same same questions for you. Thank you, Eric. Well, IDB Invest, at IDB Invest, we are all about ESG. As a multilateral development bank, we pride ourselves of having a state-of-the-art impact management framework, which allows us to identify impact indicators for every project we finance and to map every project to the sustainable development goals based on its specific impact indicators. At the same time, our ESG risk management framework incorporates, which incorporates some of the most advanced ESG risk management standards, ensures that environmental, social, and governance risks are identified and proactively managed throughout the life of the projects. And best practices in ESG are spread among private sector companies in Latin America and the Caribbean. This year, we also launched our Sustainable Debt Framework, which links our ESG-centric lending and investing approach with our capital markets activities, allowing us to issue benchmark size green social and sustainability bonds, issue bespoke deals targeting specific, narrower categories under our framework, catering to, to some investors' preferences, and issue a range of debt products, not just bonds, benchmarks, private placements, local currency bonds, commercial paper, targeting a wide range of investors. As a parting thought, what I would like the audience to remember from this panel is that IDB Invest Bonds 
are a unique opportunity for investors to add diversification to their portfolios mm -hmm. with high quality bonds that have transparent environmental mm -hmm. and social impact in economies in Latin America and the Caribbean.